I think one of the most frightening phrases most people will ever say are the words, for better or worse. And uh, of course, it's one of the lines, one of those uh, lines in the traditional Christian wedding vows. And, and we know it because it expresses a, a commitment to persevere in a marriage relationship. Uh, regardless of the external circumstances, right? We say, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. And as I've been looking at the, the book of Proverbs and seeing what it has to say about the subject of marriage this week, it, it struck me that the phrase for better or worse could be interpreted in, in a different way. It could kind of describe the experience of what marriage is. Uh, I'll explain that in just a moment. Just to review for a moment, we've been in this study of the book of Proverbs for the past two months. And what we're doing is pulling together the different, the, the Proverbs on various topics um, and so today, uh, we're concluding that, that study of Proverbs, uh, where the book itself concludes. Uh, Proverbs ends on, on the subject of marriage. And so we've seen Proverbs to be a very practical book. It gives us practical guidance and instruction for life. But when we come to the subject of marriage, it doesn't give us helpful tips for, for how to improve uh, your marriage. That's not the way Proverbs approaches it. Because remember, pr the Proverbs are written as what? As advice from a father to a son. And presumably, it's, it's a young son. So the father's advice about marriage is, is all written with the idea of getting his son to, to choose the right wife. So you've got to bear that in mind as, as we look at that. So from the perspective of Proverbs, marriage can either make life better or it can make it worse right? For better or worse. That's not what the vow means, <laughs> but that's the reality that Proverbs brings out. And so as we look at the Proverbs, it shows us four factors, I think we can sum it up this way, four factors in a great marriage. So if you are uh, single and you're considering getting married at any point in the future, the idea, the way this is laid out, is that these are the factors you want to keep in mind before you decide to marry someone. In fact, these are the factors you should consider before you even enter into some kind of dating relationship with someone because the, the fact of the matter is Proverbs tells us that our hearts are foolish and um, elsewhere in Scripture we find that our hearts are deceitful. Once you begin a relationship with someone, it's almost impossible to be objective. So these, this wisdom, this instruction is given to, to instruct young people to choose carefully. Now, I don't think that means that these lessons in Proverbs are irrelevant for those of us who are already married. Um, maybe, maybe when you chose to get married, you didn't follow the wisdom of Proverbs. Maybe you didn't make a wise choice. But Scripture never tells us to give up. By the love of God and the grace of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, people can change. Uh, and so with God's help, you can grow to become the kind of person that makes marriage better, uh, that, that fits this profile in Proverbs. But I would say this, this is not the time, uh, if you are married, this is not the time to focus on your spouse and what they need to change, okay? You let God worry about that. Think about yourself. Think about who you need to be. Uh, in fact, I'll even say this. It doesn't matter, matter whether you're married or single, young or old, because the fact of the matter is these factors that make for a great marriage are character qualities that, every, that God wants in every one of us. But you get the sense here of, of where this is, is heading, these, these qualities that, um, that to, to help someone choose wisely. In, in, in getting married. So the first factor in, in a great marriage is devotion. Devotion. Have you ever seen a horse with blinders on? Uh, my family, we went to Frankenmuth yesterday and there were horses, horses and carriages rolling around town. And of course you, you see those. And I don't know a lot about horses like some of you here do. Um, but I think I'm on safe ground saying that, that those keep a horse from being distracted. Am I right, John? Thank you. 
Um, that's, that's about the extent of my, my knowledge there. They, they can't see to the rear or the side, right? It keeps them looking straight ahead. Uh, and so if you want a great marriage, you need to look for someone who doesn't need blinders. Here's what I mean. Proverbs chapter 7 tells us about a, a man and a woman. And here's how it describes them. Uh, you can follow along in, in, in the Bible if you'd like. Because we're jumping around in Proverbs again, I have all of these scriptures also on the, on the screen. Proverbs chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 6, it says, For at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. I will say more about that. We'll keep reading in a moment. But just to see here, the choices that this man was making, they were not an accident. He is described as naive here. Uh, but to, to use the, the picture that I used a moment ago, this man needed blinders. He was making a foolish choice here. Uh, we keep reading verse 9. It says, In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night and in the darkness. And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. And catch this, her feet do not remain at home. It's not just the man who needs blinders, right? Here's, here's a woman who needs blinders. And so it says, verse 12, She's now in the streets, now in the squares, looks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. Can you believe that? I mean, here she is. She, she's coming on to this guy, and she uses a spiritual pickup line. I, I, I paid for my vows today. I went to the temple. Peace offerings. So we keep reading verse 15. She says, Therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Verse 18, Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses, for my husband is not at home. She's married. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. At the full moon, he will come home. And then verse 21 says, With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Now, it's easy for a, a, a naive young man to be attracted to a woman like this. In fact, that's probably how she got her husband in the first place. Because of her flirtatious ways. But look at what it got him. Was it a wise choice for that man to marry this woman? No, it wasn't. And so part of the lesson here in Proverbs 7, if, if, if you're a young man, this is not what you want in a wife. It may seem appealing, but if she's flirtatious before she's married, in a general way, then chances are she's going to be flirtatious after she's married. Young woman, this is not what you want in a husband. Right? We can turn this around. It goes both ways. Look for someone who will be devoted. That's why I say the character quality here is devotion. And we've already looked at this passage, but that devotion is not just a devotion of, of ignoring other people, but it's a passionate devotion. We looked at these verses a few weeks ago. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. And it's, again, advice to, to a, a man. It says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. You see, if you're, if you're married, the question is not, do you, uh, do, are, are you, are you uh, not being flirtatious like the woman in Proverbs 7? But the question is, are you truly rejoicing in the spouse that God's given you? How are we doing that? Are you growing in your devotion? So that's the first factor, devotion. 
a true devotion to one person. And if for, for someone who's single, that comes out in, in a devotion to waiting, right? not being flirtatious. A second factor in a great marriage, moving on, is trust. Trust. Now, sometimes to make your point, you have to shock people a little bit. And particularly with young men. I mean, this is advice from a father to his son. So he's got to give him a graphic image that's going to stick in his mind. And so here's the, one of those images. Proverbs 11, verse 22. As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Isn't that a great image? Do you get the point of that? I mean, it's memorable, right? And it strikes us as funny, but to the original author and his audience, that was a shocking, even disgusting picture. I mean, obviously, a gold ring is something of great value, but under the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament law, pigs were, were ceremonially, ceremonially unclean animals. No Jew would ever own a pig. I mean, much less treat it as a pet. They'd never adorn it with some kind of jewelry. But it, this proverb tells us that's the way it is with a beautiful woman who lacks discretion and wisdom. She doesn't know right from wrong. In biblical terms, she's a fool. Externally beautiful, but internally hideous. And the same could be said about a lot of men. Handsome on the outside, but disgusting on the inside. Now, for the sake of comparison, I want to take us to Proverbs chapter 31 where it describes a wise and godly woman. And I, I'm sure you know, there are countless women's Bible studies on this chapter, right? Proverbs 31 and the Proverbs 31 woman. And that's, that's good, but that wasn't the intent of Proverbs 31. It wasn't written for women. It was actually written for a man. Proverbs 31 verse 1 says this, it introduces the chapter as the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. Now, we aren't exactly sure who King Lemuel is or was. Uh, he may have been a foreign king, or some have speculated that Lemuel may have been another name for King Solomon. We don't know, but the intent of the chapter is pretty clear. Uh, that it's, it's a record of what his mother taught him. So when we come down to Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31, the, the, the passage that describes this, this woman, what you see is that this mother is giving her royal son a description of the kind of woman that he should marry. That's the intent of Proverbs 31. In fact, if you, if you look at it, uh, if we were able to look at it in the, in the original language, the Hebrew, we would see that each of the verses from verse 10 down through 31 begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's like an alphabetic acrostic. Um, and, and it walks right through. It's like an A to Z description of the excellent wife. That's the idea. It's supposed to, it's to give us this full picture. And so we, we jump down to verse 10. And what we find there are these words. It says, an excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. You see, that's what makes a woman truly excellent and valuable, is what? That her husband is able to trust her. And so the chapter launches into this description uh, in the following verses about what a diligent, trustworthy, hardworking woman was like in that day and age. Now, it's, I, I, I think it's, it's safe to say that the, the skills and, and qualities that were, were needed uh, in, in that day are different than what we would see today. But the principle, the heart of it, the diligence, is, is still a, a valid point, a valid principle to hang on to. But let's read through it. Verse 13, it says, 
She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it's still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Verse 18, she senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands with the, to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. So this is one diligent, hardworking woman. Uh, she's, she's an entrepreneur, right? She's, and this stands out uh, particularly because the ancient world tended to be a, a male-dominated culture. But this woman is so trustworthy, she's so reliable, so hardworking, that she has great independence uh, in her household and beyond. So like I say, this, the specifics of what that would look like are going to be a little bit different today. Um, but the principle of if you're looking for a husband or a wife, look for someone who can be trusted to work hard. And more importantly, beyond that, as we've been saying, make sure that you yourself are that diligent, hardworking person that is worthy of trust. So devotion, trust. And the third factor that we come to in a great marriage in, in the book of Proverbs is kindness. Here's another shocking comparison Proverbs uses to impart wisdom before marriage is from Proverbs 21, verse 19. It says, It is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. There's another one a few verses earlier that says, It's better to live in the corner of a roof. Um, now, here again, this goes both ways. Okay, we're not trying to just pick on women here. R remember, it's advice to a son. If it were advice to a daughter, we could turn it around the other way. Uh, you know, the same could be said about living with a contentious man. Uh, bickering, arguing is tiresome. Right? It, it, and to, to choose someone who's already inclined that way, that goes through life that way, is just asking for trouble. So we look again to Proverbs 31 and we see the comparison. We see the positive side. And that's where I get the idea of kindness. Proverbs 31, starting, picking it up again in verse 20. It describes the woman there in that chapter with these words. It says, she extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. So her, her kindness is demonstrated by her, her generosity. She cares about those in need. And, and catch this, as we keep reading it, it shows that she doesn't skimp on her family in doing that. Proverbs 31, verse 21, she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself, her clothing is fine linen and purple. I mean, there's this great sense of, of balance here, uh, that she cares for the poor, and yet she particularly cares for her family. She takes care of them. And yet she doesn't neglect herself in the process. And, and look at what an impact this has. Verse 23. It says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. The idea is he's known. He's respected. And I think the connection here is that her kindness reflects back on him. Right? It adds to his reputation. Now, the next verse kind of goes back to, harkens back to that idea of diligence. Verse 24, it says, She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. But then look at verse 25. I love this verse. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. What a contrast from the verse we looked at a moment ago. The contentious complainer versus someone who, with strength and dignity, who what? Who smiles at the future. Is that, is that how you look at life? I mean, we, we live in a world that, that loves 
to worry. Right? I mean, that's what the news headlines are all about. And you know, it's like we can't seem to get enough of it. We keep going back for more. More things to worry about, about politics and economics and crime and, and the environment and health. And the list just goes on and on and on of things. And, and we watch it and, and kind of build up that sense of fear. Rather than, than looking at life from the standpoint of confident faith in an all-powerful God, we just give way to worry. And when we do that, when we live life that way, we don't smile at the future. We aren't kind. We become contentious. Why? Because we're afraid and we want to control people. That's not strength. That's not the dignity that this verse is, is talking about. This strength, this dignity, this uh, ability to look to this optimism, to be able to smile at the future, it flows out of a confident trust in God. Moving on to verse 26, it tells us, uh, verses 26 and 7, it says, She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I love that phrase up in verse 26. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Could that be said of your speech? I mean, could, could people learn how to be kind by listening to you? One, a great example of that for me was, was uh, a few weeks ago when we served out at the marathon in town. And here we were, you know, lined up along the route in, and passing out water to people and trying to cheer them on. And so... I, I don't, some of you were out there, I think, longer than I, I was. I was. I was along on the sidelines there maybe for, for two or three hours. Some of you were there even, even longer. But to spend two or three hours just trying to say positive things to encourage people. What a great exercise for your spiritual life. To try, I mean, you, you don't know the people. You don't know anything about them. But you're just trying to cheer them on and keep them going as they're running by. And, and it, it puts you in a frame of mind of trying to be kind and encouraging. And we need to be that way. We need to work at that. So again, if you're going to get married, look for someone who is kind, not contentious. And uh, it's not just someone who's kind toward you, somebody who's kind to everyone. Right? It's easy to be kind while, while you're dating. It's, it's a few years down the road that that tends to melt away. Um, see how they treat others beside you. And if, if you are married, work at cultivating that kind of kindness. Pray that God would help you be that way. There's a fourth factor that comes out here um, in Proverbs. A fourth factor in a great marriage is praise. Praise. If the other three factors are in place, the devotion, the trust, the kindness, then praise is really the natural outcome of it. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4 puts it this way. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. I mean, Proverbs paints such black and white pictures, doesn't it? I mean, she's either a cancer or a crown. It's one or the other. <laughs> so, wives, do you make your husband feel like a king? Husbands, do you make your wives feel like a queen? I like the simple, straightforward words of Proverbs 18, verse 22. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And a good spouse is definitely a gift from God. And so if that's the case, if, if you have a good spouse, then that person is a, to whatever degree they're good, it's a gift from God. And that should lead to praise to God, but also praise to, for people. Here's how Proverbs 31 talks about that. Verse 
uh, Proverbs 31, verse 28. It says, her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Well, you know, kids are prone to do that, right? Kids just naturally bless their parents. Isn't it that way at your house? No, that doesn't happen. That's not our natural inclination. The only way kids learn to do that is if their parents are modeling it. Right? That's, that's the case here. This, and not in some phony, sing-song, plastic way, but because we're truly grateful. So where, where does that come from? Look at verse 30 here. It says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You see, all of this begins with a proper relationship with God. We've seen that from the very beginning of our study of Proverbs, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's when we relate to God in a proper way, when we see him as our, our creator, as our maker, as the one who, who gives us wisdom for life, and we trust in that. We, we have that healthy respect for him. That it gives us the wisdom to approach life. Only that wisdom that comes from God through Christ, through the Holy Spirit at work in, in our lives, only that can produce a life that's genuinely worthy of, of praise. So are you, are you praiseworthy? I mean, in how you live, are you, are you full of praise for others? See, these are, these are great qualities. It doesn't matter whether you're married or not. Or if you're ever going to get married. If you're this kind of person, this is, this is a blessed life. To be able to go through life and approach it this way. So just to review again, these four factors, devotion, trust, kindness, and praise. Right? That's, when those are present, it makes marriage better. Marriage makes life better. It doesn't make it worse. So, how do you need to respond today? Thinking about these verses that we've looked at in Proverbs. Maybe it's hit you kind of fast. We've moved through it quickly. Maybe you just need to take time to read back through those verses. If you didn't grab one, there's, there's note sheets uh, still out in the lobby, I think. Uh, that have all those verses list, listed so you can go back and look at them and spend some time thinking about them. Or maybe, as we've talked about this, maybe you've been convicted of some things that need to change in your life. Maybe, maybe there's some sins that need to be confessed to God, but if you're married, also to your spouse. Some violation of, of devotion. A lack of devotion or, or some way that you haven't been trustworthy. Some way that you haven't been kind failure to give praise. We're all probably guilty of that. It takes diligence and effort to, to give praise to people. So maybe a good response is just to seek forgiveness. In a constructive way of thinking, maybe a good response is to focus on one of these characteristics. Pick one of these out. And maybe for the next week, maybe the next month, Maybe the rest of the year, just focus on that. Grow in that one area. As we think about those kind of qualities that are described here. My prayer is that in our church family that there would be strong, healthy marriages. And the way that that happens is when we become these kind of people. May God help us become uh, have those qualities in our life.